So can you hear me? Yes, looks like, all right. All right, should I start? Well, bom dia, buenos dias. Um, so I was asked to talk to you about numerical relativity, uh, which, I, which I will attempt. I have worked a lot about numerical relativity in the past. Now I work a little bit. I work mostly on, on waveform modeling. Um, but now I'm going to try to explain to you how we do numerical simulations. Um, and since so I'm a computer person, which means my handwriting is not for public consumption, and so I will have mostly have slides. Also, the, so there will be a lot of material. I will not try to do really everything, 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 but all the slides will be on the web, and so you can use the slides as um, lecture notes. And then maybe as, as we go toward the last lecture, I will use a little bit more uh, the Blackboard. So, this is, so, so if you want to know what is numerical identity, you can just go to Wikipedia. You have a, a definition, so that's the branch of GR which uses numerical methods and algorithms uh, to solve and analyze problems, to solve the Einstein equations. Uh, this is a, is a complicated problem, and so very often if you want to do something which is astrophysically relevant, you have to use supercomputers, very large machines, uh, in particular to do these models of, of waveforms from complicated astrophysical systems. Um, it says, you know, a currently active field of research is, is uh, the simulation of relativistic binaries, and their gravitational waves, which is what we want to talk about. And this is other branches are also active. So there's, there really is more to it, but I won't have much time to talk about it. And then here, make one uh, addition. So, so it talks about general relativity, but of course there's another, a whole area which, uh, of numerical relativity which is becoming increasingly interesting, is to really calculate these gravitational wave signals in theories that go beyond general relativity. Some work has been done, but not a lot. And this is an interesting thing for the future. So. So, so what's, the, what's the motivation to do things numerically? General relativity has 100 years of uh, history, very proud history, and uh, it has been dominated really mostly by, by mathematical problems, by exact solutions. And over most of the history, people have been very keen to, to touch approximation methods, okay? To, to solve things approximately. And for a large part of the mathematical relativity, Community, the real post Newtonian people, like yeah, and numerical relativity people are still viewed in a strange way, okay? But and uh, so there's, there's been a lot of a lot of very interesting insight has been gained from a mathematical analysis, the post the, the positive mass theorem, and many many very interesting things. But if you really want to do, do observations, if you want to study realistic problems in astrophysics, in cosmology, you have to treat realistic situ situations with all the dirty, with all the dirty details. Um, and then exact solutions are not enough. You have to do approximations. And these approximations, usually you have to combine analytical approximations, like what Jan is going to lecture about, and numerical solutions. Um, both of these numerical and analytical, usually you do some kind of perturbation approach. In PN, you, you perturb in some physical properties, like the, like the velocity of the objects. But here, we perturb in an unphysical property, which is the, the grid resolution. Okay? And this has a great advantage, has some disadvantages, but also some great advantage, because you perturb in something unphysical. You're not bound to physical limits. You're not bound to small velocities, uh, weak fields. You can do the general, you can do the general problem. You don't have to simplify the physics. And you have mathematical control over the convergence of your approximation. And that means you can actually estimate your errors, which is ultimately of, of really uh, big um, uh, importance. All right. So what we, what we will talk about, what we will not talk about, so I'll only talk about classical gravity. I will not talk about any, anything as interesting as it may be 
quantum. You can do qu computational quantum gravity. I'll not talk about this. And we we'll only talk about solving the Einstein equations as partial differential equations. You can solve the Einstein equations numerically in other methods. Some are directly discretizing the geometry. Very, very interesting. Regi calculus, uh, other, other things. We'll not talk about that. I, I, I split the material into 10 lectures, 10 lectures of roughly half an hour. Um, and so the, the beginning is mm, really maths. Numerical relativity, to some degree, is just applied maths. And so I'll start out talking you, to you about a bit of the geometry of, of the initial value problem, ordinary differential equations, hyperbolic system, partial differential equations, the basics of numerics. We'll go more into the physics. We'll talk about how to represent black holes, how to evolve black holes, how to compute uh, gravitational waves. Uh, and, and then at the end, uh, we'll, ta we'll start to be become really, really more practical. I'll talk a bit about, about computational infrastructure. And then um, I'll try to talk a bit about how do we actually set up a black hole simulation? How do we actually work with results? How do you download uh, results from numerical simulations? How you can do some analysis with them? Probably I'll, I'll overdraw the time initially, and I will not so I'll run over time into the next lecture, and then we'll catch up a bit more of time uh, as we go along. And, and there's some practical problems. I think I put them already on the, they should be on the web, I think. There's a, I, I thought it's kind of two tracks, okay? So the first track, if you don't have too much uh, experience, or very little experience with numerics, the first one is just solve ordinary differential equations and just uh, solve the post-Newtonian black hole problem with the leading order. Precisely what um, Jan wrote here on his blackboard before. These simple equations, just for leading order, we can solve them analytically, try to solve them an, an, uh, numerically. Estimate your numerical errors is a, is a nice exercise. It's a simple system of ODEs. And the second, the second problem is solve the wave equation in, in two dimensions. This is a partial differential equation. This is much more complicated. Um, you can solve it, in fact, by converting this to a system of coupled ODEs. So in fact, the code that you have to write really is the same code as and the first problem, a coupled system of ODEs. But then there's a lot more complications and you have to do more things. Uh, for the first uh, problem, I have put like four or five slides on, on the web page to, 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 to explain to you what they, actually the equations are, what to do. And for the second one, there's a longer, there's a longer, uh, longer notes, about 20 pages or so. Uh, but I think they're very, very detailed. Like just work through them and it tells you what to do. And it tells you what, what questions to ask about the code. I have not yet put example code on the web pages, but I think I'm going to do it later today, which I have it mostly in Python. Uh, you can do that also. All right, if you, uh, um, which programming should you choose? Well, the one that you're familiar with, okay? I can help you, I think, reasonably well with the ones that I wrote down. Maybe I can help you with something else, but just use something. Don't use something that is fancy, just, just to make it fancy. Just use the tool that you're most familiar with. All right, and, and the last, Thing. So what are the goals of these lectures? Um, so really, one is to, to, to understand where numerical results comes from. What, what are, how are they computed? What are the shortcomings? Uh, if you want to use these results, if you want to use these waveforms for some analysis, it's good to know where they actually come from. They're not perfect. They have their shortcomings. Um, some maybe because calculation was just very expensive. And it's good to understand things. I want to... Um, I talk a lot about the basic problems that one faces. What are the what are the basic concepts you need to understand? I'm not, I'm not going to talk too. I'll talk a little bit, but not too much about what's the what are the details of the current state of the art. Okay, the last papers we had this year and all some kind of fancy things. I think that the, the most important thing in this field, which can be very very confusing, is to have a solid understanding of what are the few basic principles that these calculations rely on. And this is what I focus on. Um, yeah, so want to create some awareness for, for this long path from theory to some real results. I want to get you ready maybe to get some details from the literature and also in the hand exercises to start and just playing around with some code. Now, the, so there's going to be a lot of maths. Okay? This uh, might be a bit boring for some, so just, just spice it up a bit and because the time is, uh, the time is uh, well. Uh, so an announcement first, so you may well know this. So, it's, it's, um, 
five, five to twelve. So we so in so at eleven local time, so quite uh, some time ago. So there was a, a announcement, press release from LIGO and Virgo, and so they have uh, released their compact binary coalitions catalog from the 01 and 02 observation run. So 02 actually finished uh, last August, and there has been a number of detections that have been announced, but, but it is, this was not the full analysis. And our full analysis uh, has just been released, in fact, on Saturday, very quietly, and the press release came uh, today. So previously, August last year, you're right, sorry. Yeah, it, it seems so short. Yeah, August last year, that's right. So you see, you see, you see how long, so, so that's, a, that's a good point. So, so it was finished August last year. Now this is more than a year ago and it has taken all this time to finish the analysis. It's, it's a lot of work. Uh, hundreds of people have worked on finishing this catalog. It's just a lot of work. Uh, so previously we had five binary black hole gravitational events. events on which was called LVT for LIGO Virgo trigger because it wasn't was a trigger, it wasn't that we should be treated as a real event. And we had one binary neutron star. And so now we go to 11. So now we have 10 binary black hole mergers. So we have four new events. And the LVT trigger was upgraded to a real event. So 10 binary black hole and the binary neutron star event. There has not been another binary neutron star. All the data are open and there's some tutorials. So you can go to the website. Uh, GWopenscience.org. Uh, you can look at all the data, but there's also some tutorials, hands-on tutorials that you can use to work with this data. And so this is one way of summarizing the results. This uh, plot, which gets updated with every release, masses the stellar graveyard, all the um, neutron stars and black holes that are known. Uh, so here the, the little ones are the ones which are known from electromagnetic observations blue from gravitational wave events, and so we have uh, 10 BBH events, which gives us uh, 30, binary, 30 black holes, but for each event, there's the two that uh, have merged, and the final one, so 30. And so if you count this, you will see that by now, the, large, so the larger number of black holes that have been observed have been observed through gravitational waves. And then the neutral stars, you see that there's lots of neutral stars which we have observed electromagnetically, and then, then two from gravitational waves. I will not talk about results because I will talk about results more in the colloquium on Wednesday. This is an overview of all the results. I just want to highlight a few results. So for example, one, one thing to highlight is you see them here ordered by date. So this is, uh, this is the date of the event. For example, here, 17th of August, so 2017, uh, 23rd of August, and you see um, so the last day of July, and then in August, this was in total six events, six events within less than one month. So this was, this was an amazing uh, month for, for the collaboration. It was just after Virgo was uh, switched on. So Virgo people, they really get their money's worth. It, it wasn't, you see, we had, uh, so this was the first event in you know, 02, then there was one in June, many months later. Virgo was going to join for a month. It wasn't very likely that they will see anything. And then in this month, in fact, there were six events. Um, we have, what do we have here? Here we have the binary neutron star event, which is a signal to noise ratio, which is the loudest event. Uh, this is the uh, lightest black hole. And this is the heaviest. Uh, so uh, total mass of the final black hole, about 80 solar masses. Um, this also has uh, clearly seems to have um, non-zero spin. That's quite interesting, and it's very very far away. So this is about so 2,750 megaparsecs. So that's about uh, nine billion years ago. All right, this this is the farthest uh, that has been seen by so by far. This had this this event has been emitted about twice the age of the solar system. And this is at a reasonable cosmological distance, so it's a redshift of almost one half. And so, it is, so just to create some excitement, and I will talk about this more on Wednesday. So now we go into math, maths and uh, geometry. So first, we want to talk about the initial value problem for GR. So we have some manifold, and now we want to evolve this manifold in time, step by step. So why do we want to do that? Um, 
So classical physics is formulated in terms of partial differential equations for tensor fields. And to understand some physical theory, whether it's GR, maybe QCD, uh, we have to understand the, the space of solutions of these PDEs and describe this space of solutions. We have to ask, what predictions do these solutions make for observations? So to do this in a systematic, which means an algorithmic way to find approximate solutions of these partial differential equations. So as I said before, interpretive approaches, numerical analysis. The Einstein equations, they are intrinsically four-dimensional. They don't have a time coordinate, so we have to massage them to give us a formulation where we start at some time and then we go forward in time. Uh, then we can ask, so if you, if you have, does a unique time evolution exist, in fact, for these equations? Does it depend continuously on the initial data? If, the, if this is not true, then this theory of GR doesn't really give us predictability. And if it doesn't give predictability, uh, then we lo lose a very s important source of physical intuition. So um, does the theory have an initial value formulation? In fact, yes. And it has many, it has infinitely many. It is one of the there's no unique such formulation. And we have to go into this a bit deeper. So summary of this is that, so these are the Einstein equations, very simple, wonderful. And only starting in the 1950s, so after several decades, people had uh, really worked and had some success in converting this in, this in this kind of initial value problem, where you have a manifold, you specify initial data at some hypersurface sigma, and then you go forward in time. If you, if, you, if you just take these tensor equations and you say, okay, let's just choose some coordinate system, then basically what you get is 10, for one for each component, coupled non Linear wave equations. If you make this, if you make a smart choice, you just get ten coupled nonlinear kind of generalized wave equations. But the, but the source terms for these equations are very very complex, hundreds of terms or thousands of terms, which makes the mathematical analysis quite uh, complicated. As the other known fundamental theories of nature, um, so in particular Young Mills theories, uh, this is also gauge theory, and this can create some complications of gauge theories. I think you're not with what a gauge theory is. We're all, we're all what is this? Who is? Who is not familiar? Um, so so there, there's, a, there's a presence of, of gauge freedom which leads to constraints. We're not really working with the true degrees of freedom, the true physical degrees of freedom, and so this leads to uh, to nasty problems, including constraints, so restrictions on the space of data which we can choose. And if you have if you have such a theory, if you want to solve it numerically, you always have a big problem that that if you solve your constraints initially, you don't do this exactly. There will be a small error, and then you only in the physically correct theory if the if the constraints are satisfied exactly. Now, if you just make a small initial violation that's initially fine, but will, this, will your violation remain small, or will it just grow and grow and grow and grow? Generically, you have to assume that maybe it will just get worse and worse and worse and worse. So this is a problem that you have to solve. In electromagnetism, it's understood. We know exactly how to handle this. In general activity, in general, we, we do not know how to handle it. But it turns out, for simple cases like binary black holes, we get lucky, and it actually works out. Um, all right, so this is just uh, to remind us of a few things that we're going to use afterwards, so the different types of partial differential equations, you're well familiar with this, so we have hyperbolic, parabolic, Schrodinger, and elliptic, and the, the ones that we're interested in is really just uh, elliptic and hyperbolic, and mostly I'll talk about hyperbolic, I'll talk, I'll talk about the evolution, not a lot about uh, constraints. So now a few, a few basic uh, concepts that we have to understand. And the, the one, one is well-posedness, and then also stability, which is for the discrete case. And this is now for evolution equations, which afterwards will be hyperbolic. And we have to, we have to distinguish two types of problems that we will handle. One is the continuum problem. These are differential equations. And then we're going to discretize them, them in some way. And then we have to handle the discrete problem. But well-posedness, this issue of well posedness applies to both. So how does it work out? How does well posedness work out in the continuum? Uh, so so well posedness means that a unique solution exists 
for GR, this is a bit subtle because first we have to choose our coordinate system. The Einstein equations, they don't tell you what coordinates to use, and so they don't give you any unique solution for your tensor components. They only give you a unique solution for the tensor components if you have specified what the coordinate systems, what coordinate system you're supposed to use. Uh, but then they give you a unique solution, and then it has to depend continuously on the initial data. And the convenient way of formulating this that's used in this context is you have two constants, call them K and A, which are real numbers, so that the norm of the solution, now the solution is several tensor fields, but we just make a shortcut here, just U of T is my solution. The norm, I mean also which norm, did, yeah? K should be positive, yeah. I can, no, I can also be positive. You can, you, so, so, but I'll get to that, okay? It can be positive. Um, so, so what, what this gives you is a bound on the time evolution in some norm. I don't say what norm it is, so basically you are supposed to figure out what's a, what's a convenient, what's an appropriate norm to actually use. That's another question. Uh, and then the, the, uh, the evolution is bounded by your initial data, okay? As you know, there's an there's a e to the a t, a can be positive, so, so exponential growth is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with exponential growth, okay? This may be inconvenient, but it's certainly well posed, all right? What, what, what is important is you, that these constants are, can be chosen uniformly and, and not, you have to choose a different constant for each initial data set. Okay, that would be uh, not, not allowed. So exponential growth, which is instability in a physical sense, that's okay, but you can't have arbitrarily fast growth. Uh, and you, can, you want to have something which is called mode stability. So you can't have modes, let's say particular frequencies, which grow arbitrarily fast. You could, you could imagine some initial data which have different modes, so different frequency components, and if each frequency component grows at a different rate, let's say higher frequencies grow at faster rates, uh, then that would not be allowed, that can't work. So, so in an ill-posed problem, which means a non-well-posed problem, the typical thing is that, that higher frequencies correspond to larger A and K. And so if you have a better resolution, you can have higher frequencies, and the higher frequencies go grow faster, so you actually have a worse solution. So that, that's the problem to avoid, okay? And then there's a, a version of this in a discrete problem where discrete well-posedness or discrete stability, which is not the same as this, this stability here. Um, so for some iterative problem, so you have a discrete, this discrete solution at some time step and then you iterate to get the next time step. So your solution at time step n plus one is some operator Q, which can depend on all kinds of things, applied to the solution at the previous step and you get a relation which is just uh, basically the same thing as here, just rewritten, okay? But what is important, so for example here, we have e to the alpha time step n, and so if, if this is proportional to t, that's okay, but for example, if this would be proportional to n, the, the ratio number, then with higher resolutions it would go faster and faster, and that would be consistent with this. All right, and then there's a, a very important related theorem, which is called the lax equivalence theorem, which says, uh, and this is strictly only true for linear PDs. I want nonlinear, so we'll see later how we can make nonlinear work. But a consistent, which means consistent means formally convergent, so basically the local error converges to zero. Uh, a finer difference scheme for a linear PDE, for which the initial value problem is well posed, is convergent, if and only if it's so if you have some continuum equations which are well posed, uh, and then you write down some discretization which is consistent, then if it's convergent, it's stable, and if it's stable, it's convergent. So you're happy. Okay, that's what you have to achieve for uh, numerics. But there's another related concept which is really key to understand how numerics work, and that's conditioning. A uh, simple way of explaining this is consider some very simple model problem. Uh, some function f of x and y is supposed to be zero. 
Okay? Uh, maybe you have some algorithm now to solve this, but now we want to ask, how sensitive is the dependence of the solution Y on the input X? What's the error that we make? And, and you can quantify this, the standard way of quantifying this is with the condition number K, which basically gives you the worst possible effect on Y when your input X is perturbed. Uh, so let's work, let's work out how this looks like. So let's say we have a, a perturbed equation. So we have X plus delta X and Y plus delta Y is zero. And then we define this conditioning number, which is the maximum over uh, the delta X's of the relative error in the solution Y divided by the relative error in the, in the input X. Okay? Tells you that if I change my input X a little bit, how much does the solution change? If, if I change my input a tiny bit, and the solution changes a lot, now that's not going to be practical. That's not going to work. Okay? Um, so if K is small, it's called well-conditioned. And if K is large, it's called ill-conditioned. And if K is infinity, then we call it ill-post. So that's the, uh, the opposite of, of um, uh, well-post. Uh, and so if K is finite, it's well-post. If it's infinite, it's ill-post. So for example, in numerical relativity, what do we have to do? Well, we have to find a well-post partial differential equations problem, make a stable a convergent discretization, and then, for example, we have to find a coordinate gauge so that it's actually well conditioned. That, that may not be very easy because let's, let's assume you have a metric which is really boring. Okay? There's not much going on. Let's, let's make a, a little drawing. So this, I have, this, this is one of my metric components, maybe. It, it looks really boring. There's not, not, not much going on. That's x coordinate here. Okay? That's my metric mu new component. But now if I change my coordinate, I choose stupid coordinates, then this gradient is really different maybe. It may be, maybe, it looked, maybe the gradient is much, much larger in this other coordinate. It has some strange features. But because I've chosen bad coordinates, a bad time coordinate. And so, so how you choose your coordinates is, is, is important and has a large effect on whether you have a well-conditioned problem or not. All right. So now, before we do the initial formulation of GR, let's do something that you already know, in principle, which is the initial value uh, formulation of Maxwell's equations. Now let's see how this is similar. So you could, you could have started Maxwell's equations which, with this four-dimensional formulation in terms of the Faraday tensor. And that's very elegant. Everybody tells you, now we have this uh, formulation is super elegant. But, but how do I actually compute things? Because this is now all four-dimensional. How do I convert this in some algorithm to solve my equations? So what you can use is what's called the 3 plus 1 decomposition. So here we have our manifold M, and now we make a 3 plus 1 decomposition. So we have hypersurfaces, T equals constant. We'll call them sigma. And we just foliate our spacetime by these hypersurfaces. They're space-like here. They have a unit normal N, which is time-like. And then we can define these funny quantities, E and B, which of course are the electric field and the magnetic field, and we define them in this way. So for the F is projected with the time-like unit normal, and the B uh, it has this uh, three-dimensional epsilon tensor, which is the epsilon tensor of the manifold sigma. And so now you have this definition, you insert them into the Maxwell equation, so you crank and crank, and you get the following equations. You get four equations, but they, they, have, they are of two different types. You get these two equations, which have time derivatives of E and B. So you recognize here, this is the cross product. So this is what you're used to. Uh, these, are, these have time derivatives. And then these other two equations, they do not have time derivatives. They are constraints. They tell you that you cannot choose E and B freely, but you have to choose them according to these conditions. So uh, therefore, what you have to do is you, you, you choose which hypersurface you want to start on. Then you solve these conditions first. Once you have your initial data, you can use these equations to tell you what's the solution at a later time. Of course, you have to be careful, because then you have to check that this is really consistent, that, that if these equations are satisfied at t equals 0, and these are satisfied always, then you have to show that then these are also satisfied at all later times. In fact, it's, that's an easy exercise, I suggest you just try this out. This is just two or three lines, very, very simple in flat space. 
Uh, if you have uh, matter equations, then of course your Maxwell equations need to be solved consistently, consistently with any other equations you have which describe the matter content of your spacetime. All right, so this is the exercise. It's very simple. Let's try it out. Um, then, so you, you have to, we have to make sure that the whole thing makes sense, that constraints are, are uh, preserved, and you can show that indeed you have a well-posed initial value problem for this. Uh, and then information, you can check that information propagates at the speed of light, and we'll soon see the speed of the propagation of the information is very important in the analysis of whether you have a well-posed initial value problem. Um, then just to point out a few more other things. So of course you know that you can write the whole thing in a different way. You can write it in terms of the uh, vector potential. And, and, and if you write it in terms of the vector potential, you get this equation. Uh, but then you know what, that usually, uh, you, you look at this, you say, I don't like this equation, in fact. But, but this is just the wave operator. So I choose a special gauge to make this zero. I choose this gauge. And then I get just the wave equation. And the wave equation is obviously well posed and has all the nice features. And I'll say this because we'll see afterwards that in uh, general relativity, you can make a trick which is just a tensor analog of this and is something that's very important. Now, the numerical solutions of the Maxwell equations are something that's extremely important in all kinds of technology. And people do very, very complicated electromagnetic uh, problems. Um, but, so this, it's, it's, it's difficult, but it's also well understood. And in particular, it's well understood how to write algorithms that exactly preserve your constraints. If you have a, in a flat, well, in a flat background, it's, but also in a, in a curved background. If you, if you write the constraint evolution equations on a curved background, so these are here with the, the lead derivative. Who, who doesn't know what the lead derivative is? We all know the lead derivative. Excellent. So this is just the time derivative, right? So this is the time derivative of the E constraint. It's the time derivative of the B constraint. You can work this out on a, on a curved background, and you get these right-hand sides. Okay? They look very nice and simple, but they're not nice. You can, so, so K here is, the, is uh, the trace of the extrinsic curvature. And in a, in a, in a non-flat uh, space-time, or even in Minkowski space, if you choose a non-flat slice, so that's not zero. This has some value. Uh, if, if your slices are locally collapsing, then k is negative. And you can see that then the constraint quantity is proportional to itself with a positive constant. And so it's going to grow exponentially. OK? So this can never work numerically. You just drift away exponentially from your constraint surface, and things go very bad. Um, so you have a well-posed problem, but it's not practical to solve. OK? Uh, for Maxwell, it's very well known what the solution is. You just choose new variables, which you multiply with the square root. So you put the index up, and you multiply with the square root of the determinant of the metric. You, you do the same analysis for these equations, and then these bad terms go away, and you're happy, even in a curved background. Uh, but what to do for GR, in fact, is not really understood. We know that we have these problems, and you're sufficiently lucky you don't suffer from it, but it's a, it's a thing that one has to be well aware of. All right. So now we will do the, the 3 plus 1 decomposition for uh, GR. So we'll first do the, like the fast track, and then write up. So the simplest way to think about getting this 3 plus 1 decomposition is, is this very simple cartoon. So And so now we want to write a metric or line element ds squared in these, um, in these coordinates here. So we have chosen some coordinates, x, i, and t. i is 1, 2, 3. And so now it turns out we can, just from the picture, we can read off what is the line element. So the line, so that the, the ds squared is somehow is the time part, the time distance squared plus the space distance squared. This is relativistic, so the time distance squared has a minus. OK? And so uh, the time step is basically whatever the coordinate is dt times whatever, some, some scalar, which we just call alpha for the moment. And then we also have the freedom between these two points to just shift our space coordinates a little bit. Let's call this vector beta. 
and then this is the spatial distance squared, and this is time-like distance squared. So all together, this is this ds squared, the space-time distance. So this is our, these are now our metric components. And now we could just in, in, introduce these metric components, our h, a, b, beta, and alpha, into the Einstein equations, work it all out, and we have some 3 plus 1 decomposed version of the Einstein equations. Okay, so this is a simple way of doing that. Uh, the details are that, so this is a positive definite matrix, the H, is basically this is the Riemannian metric on these three spaces of constant time, T, and then usually you want that alpha is, doesn't change sign. And then there are these four functions, alpha and the vector beta, which you can just specify as you like. They, they steer your coordinates through the space-time, and you say what they're supposed to be. So this is your kind of space-time engineering. The physics is independent of this choice, because you have diffeomorphism in, in variance, but of course all the practical aspects are highly dependent on whether you make a good choice uh, or not. All right, and then I'll say more about this on the next slide. Uh, so now I'll, I'll just go very, very fast through uh, some more details, but you can, you can work them out uh, yourself. I don't want to spend too much time on it. I'll just give you a flavor of what this looks like. So now, so we have this uh, foliation of the space-time. Let's, let's make a little drawing of that, just what we had before. So this is my four-dimensional space-time M. And then I have my hypersurface sigma t, let's say, and then this is a bit later, sigma t plus. All right, and so so I have I can have a whole foliations of these surfaces which describes my whole manifold M. And so now what I want to do is I want to describe my my space-time evolution as basically a movie these three spaces. I want, to, I want to, just like I did with Maxwell, I had the E and the B field, which are just three-dimensional vectors, three-dimensional tensors. They live on, they live in sigma on this three-dimensional manifold, and now I want to see how my three-dimensional objects change in time. So what I have to do is I basically have to write all my tensors in, in the, what's called the horizontal and the vertical parts. The horizontal ones are Basically, they have all the components in the three-dimensional sigma, and the vertical is maybe they also have a component orthogonal to it. And so I'm writing uh, all my equations in this uh, horizontal and vertical parts. Uh, so now again, I, I choose a, a, a time-like unit normal, which, which I can write this as basically have some, um, this, this function t, which is my, my function of constant time, uh, I can take the gradient of it, and then this has to be basically proportional to this one. So this is my future time-like uh, unit normal. And now what I can do is I define some projection operators, which project my four-dimensional tensors to the horizontal direction or to the vertical direction. And now I just have to find out what these projection operators are. I mean, you can try this yourself. Maybe just th think about what, what, what could that be. And you'll find out that basically these are the projection operators. So the time-like one is you multiply with one of these n vectors, unit normals, and then multiply again with one. Uh, and then the space-like projection, space-like projection is basically the unit matrix minus the time-like projection. So these are your two projection operators. And now you can, you, can, uh, you can check that they are actually projection operators. So doing it to a projection twice is the original operator. Check it for this, check it for this. You check that they are orthogonal. And so these have the uh, appropriate uh, properties. So this one is, is, is tangential. So the, the, this one applied to the unit time like normal is, of course, zero. And so they have all the right properties. You can, you can first apply this to the metric. And then, then projecting the metric in this way, you get a tensor field H, which you can, because you're doing the calculation, you find that this is basically the, the original metric plus N A and B. And of course, this is kind of intuitive because, because if, you, if you write this to the other side, you get the metric as minus N A and B, which is like your minus DT squared plus the spatial part H, which is what we had before. Right, so here we had our time-like part and the spatial part, which is the H, and so we see, well, now we have this done fancy with projection operators, 
and this is just basically the same story. And then you can you, you find that this is purely horizontal, so this is lives in the three spaces, it's a positive definite metric, and so this is the natural Riemannian metric on this sigma. So this gives you the distances on sigma, and then you have your unit normal in. Okay. Now um, let's talk a second about curvature. There are two types of curvature, right? You know that. There's the intrinsic curvature, which is the Riemann tensor, and there's the extrinsic curvature, which describes how a surface, a hypersurface sigma, how it bends in its surrounding space-time A. And so now we, have, we need uh, these two types of curvature to introduce to, to describe a hypersurface. So we can, we can define a natural derivative operator, usually right with a round D, which is associated with the H, which, which is just basically taking the covariant four-dimensional derivative and projecting down all the indices that you have, projecting them down to your three-dimensional manifold. So that uh, looks complicated, but it's a very simple uh, construction to give you the Riemann tensor of this three-dimensional metric H. And then there's the extrinsic curvature, usually called K. Uh, you can define with this funny um, uh, formula, but also very more intuitive. This is one half of the lead derivative direction of the unit normal of the metric. So this is basically just the time derivative of your three metric. Okay, so something like the velocity. If, if the three metric is yeah, like your configuration space variable, now this is going to be up to a factor of one half is your velocity. Uh, now you could just insert this into the Einstein equations and, and, and calculate what you get. Oops. Um, it turns out this is quite complicated, but there are two very useful uh, crucial geometric identities which give you the relation between the three-dimensional and the four-dimensional Riemann tensors and the extrinsic curvature. And these are called the gauss godazzi equations. Uh, you can take those, and then it's still quite a long calculation, which I'm not going to go into to rewrite your Einstein equations in these new quantities. We've talked about uh, choosing your slices sigma. There's another thing you have to choose, uh, which we, you can call this a threading. In fact, let's, let's look at the picture first. The picture is somewhat the same picture we had before. It's now it's like 3D, it's a bit more fancy. So you have to tell you have a family of observers which are experiencing your space-time. Let's say here is this uh, world line of the observer, and you have to tell your observers how they have to move through the space-time. Um, so if you have some tangent vector, you know, d by dt, then here, this is, here it's called t mu, so this is the tangent vector of the observers, and now you can split this tangent vector into the parts we had before, so a part which is proportional to the unit normal. Uh, so here we have our unit normal, and so there's a part which is like this function alpha times the unit normal, and then there's another function which is this beta vector which we had before, which is purely space-like. And so we can split it up in this way, so these are two are orthogonal. And we can, so now we want to write the time derivative of any tensor in this setup. And so if you choose these coordinates, which are adapted to our time coordinates, then basically you are, for, for any tensor t, the time derivative, t dot, so these are adapted coordinates, and it's not just the lead derivative in the direction of the vector field that is the tangent to our observers. So, so this is how we get, or this is just the partial derivatives, this is how we get uh, um, time derivatives. And then again, we can do our space-time engineering where we just dynamically steer this vector ta through the evolution of the space-time. And then these two free functions, we hit this alpha and beta, uh, we call them usually laps. So the laps alpha, it says how fast the time elapses. And then the shift vector beta, it just tells how you shift them around spatially. So how you reparameterize in space. And these four degrees of freedom, they're not determined by the Einstein equations. You have to choose them, which means it's very easy to choose them in a very unfortunate way. Um, and then, so you have done all this, and so now you can project your original Einstein equations here in vacuum. You can just project them down. There are three, what, three different projections you can do. So one is you take your Einstein tensor, and then this is the mixed projection. One time direction projection, one space-like projection. This is the time-time projection. 
And then this is the space space projection. These are the three different options that you have. And these are the results after long, long calculation. I, I remember at least once in your life, try to do this, try to do this calculation, try to do it by hand, and maybe also by, by computer algebra to try to do two things. Um, so here, what do we get? For these two, we get equations which have derivatives of the extrinsic curvature. Here we have the three-dimensional Riemann tensor, but they don't have time derivatives. So these are just like the constraints of Maxwell's theory. They don't have time derivatives. And this equation here does have a time derivative. Uh, so this is the actual real evolution equation that has the physics of how things evolve. And then there is this identity, uh, which I'm sure you know, the Bianchi identity, which says that the um, Einstein tensor is divergence free, and that you can use this to show that these pro constraints propagate. That if there's zero initially, and the time evolution is, holds everywhere, then these are also true at all times. So now you have some equations, and so people in the beginning of the mid uh, 70s said, okay, we have equations, let's, co let's code them up, let's do numerical relativity, let's uh, collide black holes, but then people found out it's actually not that easy, and it took them another uh, uh, until 2005, until it actually worked, and another 10 years or so since 2005 to make it, well wor make it work well enough to do gravitational wave data analysis with this. Um, now here, here I've wrote, written the uh, equations like before, complete, so we had uh, with matter terms for your reference, so we have the two constraints, we have the evolution equation for k dot, and of course since the extrinsic curvature was defined as the lead derivative of h, so this is basically h dot is k. So we have two evolution equations, this is kinematical, and this is dynamical, and two constraints. And you can, you can do a simple exercise to, now that you have this 3 plus 1 decomposition, to compute the, how many degrees of freedom you have, uh, and, and you should get the result of 2, counting how many tensor components you have in these equations. Uh, there are also other ways of writing down an initial value problem, the writing down evolution equations for the Einstein equations. A very important one is the harmonic or generalized harmonic formulation. Uh, and, and this one is really designed for mathematical simplicity uh, to, to look as much as possible as like the wave equations so that we have theorems that know how to handle this. And this was used by Yvonne Choquet-Bréa in the mid-50s early 50s, for, to, for the first time, write the Einstein equations as a well-posed initial problem. It was a very big, uh, important breakthrough. The way that we usually use this is called generalized harmonic, and it's due to these two people, and uh, um, you can find the details in this very, very, very long article. And, and what's the idea? So let's write out the Einstein equations in terms of the derivatives of the metric, which means in terms of the Christoffel symbols. Let's do this. So this is Einstein equations. It's basically the Riemann tensor. Uh, if it's vacuum, then the equations are Riemann, uh, sorry, um, Ricci tensor. Ricci tensor is zero. So let's write this out. It is long sausage, a very complicated uh, thing here. So now we would like to see some simple structure. And we see that, so this here, this is actually the wave operator. So we have derivatives, lambda rho, contracted with lambda rho component of the metric. So on every component, g mu nu of the metric, this is just the wave operator. And then there is a lot of source terms, and then there's a derivative of, the, of gamma, which is derivative of the um, derivative. So this is, also part of the, this is also part of the principal part. And so if that's not zero, then we do not have the wave equation. We have something else, just in the same way as just using the um, vector potential in the Maxwell equations, gives you the, the um, wave equation plus something else, which you can get rid of by a nice gauge condition. And you just do use the same trick, okay? So you could either say, we choose a gauge that this is zero, could go away, or we say, we choose a gauge condition where we just fix this as something which is fixed in theory by some exterior condition, and then this tells us what our coordinates are gonna be. Uh, and this is, this is the, uh, so if you work this out, you see that, that um, the contracted Christoffel is just a source term for the wave operator on the coordinates. And so if I prescribe this, this just tells me through this partial differential equation what my coordinates are. I can, I can write this condition, in fact, I can write it as my lapse and shift to be consistent with what we had on the previous slide. You get this kind of longish, but not too complicated equations. 
the, in order to really satisfy the Einstein equations, now this has to be satisfied. So now this takes the role of a constraint equation that has to be satisfied. Um, and, then, and then you can solve, basically, this generalized wave equation, which this is something being prescribed, and all these complicated source terms. So for this, you have, basically, you have all the theorems you need. It's, it's well posed, and it's all, all very nice. Um, but of course, you still have to figure out all the other problems of making it well conditioned, make it really practical, make it work for black holes, and so on, which is also complicated, has taken a lot of time. Um, you can write this directly with a metric, but you could also, with a four-dimensional metric, but you can just as well write it in terms of your three metric um, and the lapse and shift. It just it's the same. It has the same mathematical properties, basically. Um, all right. You can also, for example, you can, take, you can take the previous equations and use this gauge, but this would, this would be, because it has different um, strain terms, it has actually very different properties. In fact, it's not well posed. Um, all right. What else? Um, so this is just a, a brief historic remark. So for, for most of the history of American relativity, people basically used these standard 3 plus 1 decomposed equations in a form which is called York ADM, which, which, which uh, emphasizes geometric intuition, how you, how, you choose your, how you choose your lapse and shift, whereas the harmonic formulation, this really emphasizes simplicity from a partial differential equations point of view. Um, and then until, so now, other formulations that we'll get into tomorrow are used. Before, um, basically, people took mostly this version here, very straightforward discretization, second order, uh, the most, most basic discretizations. And this actually, all of this worked very well in spherical symmetry, but not for anything more complicated. Uh, this, these people realized this in about the mid-90s or so, and then it took them another 10 years or more to figure out how, how to actually make this work, what, what formulations of the Einstein equations are useful, how to dis discretize them, and so on. Um, all right, so in order to, have, in order to understand you know, how this, how, why this doesn't work, how it actually works, now we're going to need some more time today and tomorrow. All right. Does everybody know what's the domain of dependence? Or who doesn't know what's the domain of dependence? Everybody knows. Oh, excellent. You don't know what the domain of dependence is? I'm going to skip that. All right. Um, do you all know what is global hypervolicity? No. Um, so you can, you, you can read this. I'll just give you a brief, a, a brief maybe blackboard explanation. So if this is, let's say, this is my sigma surface. This is my, here my initial data live, which is the part of the space time which is entirely, de depend, which is entirely determined by my initial data. This is basically this like forward, inward kind of light cone. And I can also draw this to the past. And so I call this d plus, the future domain of dependence. I call this d minus, the past domain of dependence. And obviously, I make the definition of the whole domain of dependence is the union of d plus and d minus. So these are all the, this is the whole part of the space time, which is entirely determined by data on this hypersurface sigma. Okay, and then I say a good spacetime, which can be described by an initial value problem, is a spacetime where the, the, the domain of dependence of my initial data surface is identical with the whole manifold. So, this, so in this case, I have a manifold which can be completely, to the future and to the past, be described by an initial value formulation. And such spacetimes are called globally hyperbolic, and they have nice properties. They have a uh, time function. You can, you can label each point by a specific time. And they have exactly those uh, properties that you want to have a space time which is predictable. And it, does, and, and it doesn't allow things which ruin predictability like time machines, for example. So these are the kind of space times for our initial value problem. So now, now you see, I was very lazy. <laughs> Just explain on the so now, so now uh, there are different types of initial value problems. For example, there's the Cauchy problem. So what's the Cauchy problem? The Cauchy problem is where we evolve these uh, Cauchy surfaces, the ones which a Cauchy surface is a surface such that its domain of dependence is the whole manifold. And so we, so, so they're, they're space-like, and so whatever this, we can take these to the future, take these to the past. 
And so a Cauchy problem is where we, we describe the space-time in this foliation of space-like surfaces. But we, can, we can choose completely different types of surfaces. For example, we could choose null surfaces. And that leads to many, many uh, simplifications in how to write the equations, makes them much simpler, and has a great advantage because these null surfaces go all the way to scry plus to null infinity. And of course, if you want to model gravitational wave signals, where in the space-time do we have to compute the gravitational wave signal? We have to compute it at null infinity because that's where the observers are. Right? You are, if you look at an astronomical system, you are at null infinity because you're looking at this through null rays, gravitational waves, electromagnetic waves. Uh, so this is your line of sight. Uh, you are here. Okay? But, but uh, so this, if you, if you choose null surfaces, you can also make them like this, you can cross. So this is called the characteristic initial value problem. Very, very nice characteristic initial value problem, very much simpler, but it's also very rigid because you have this fixed coordinate system of null rays, and null rays have a very bad feature, namely they form caustics, and when they have a caustic, then the coordinate system breaks down. So, for example, this you can only do this if either you have spherical symmetry, or you're really far away from the source, you don't have caustics. All right? So now, you see, with these slices, you don't reach null infinity where you actually want to be. With these, you can do that, but it has um, some problems. So there's another funny way, which is mostly due to this guy, Friedrich, um, the same guy of the generalized harmonic formulation. Now, you say, now I'm smart. I choose space-like hypersurface, but not like this one, but, uh, but like this. This is space-like and goes to null infinity. Okay? And these ones are called hyperboloidal. This is the hyperboloidal, hyperboloidal initial value problem. Initial value problem. And so this in Minkowski space would be a hyperboloid. Okay. So these are the three standard types of initial value problem. They're all interested, interesting for numerical relativity. In fact, I will only talk about this one. Okay. All right. So now we have 20 minutes left. So now we have 20 minutes to just give you a brief intro what you need to know about ordinary differential equations, okay? okay can we just switch off the light again? So, um, we're really interested in doing partial differential equations, but if you don't understand ordinary differential equations, there's no sense that you're going to make much sense out of partials. So, don't try to understand partial differential equations without having a solid understanding of what it is. Um, so, so the first thing that you do when you want to solve for the E's is you write them as this kind of normal form first order in your in time variable. Okay? So here we have a system of all the E's. You write them in this way. First order in time. Prime is your time derivative. Uh, you can do this by just you know, introducing new variables. You can always write things in this way. Um, a standard result of ordinary differential equations theory, which I think you all uh, somehow know intuitively, it's kind of obvious, is that the ODE initial value problem is well posed. Okay? If you give initial data, you give this vector y at t equals t0, then there's a unique solution for later times, at least for some finite time. Okay? Maybe not for an infinite time, but at least for some finite time you can solve this. Global solution may or may not exist. Uh, in fact, if you have nonlinear ODEs, very typically you have trouble. For example, this is a very simple nonlinear ODE. You can solve it analytically. This is the solution. And you can see that uh, here this is uh, something positive, minus 1, so this can be 0, and then it blows up. So a very typical feature for nonlinear ODEs is that they can produce singularities in a finite time. And of course, this is very uh, relevant for the Einstein equation. Because for the Einstein equations, if you have strong fields, we can form singularities in a finite time in a more complicated way than this, but this is the basic thing that's happening. Also, all these can be chaotic in nature. So, for example, the, the, the Lorentz equations are very, very simple equations, but they create very complicated chaotic behavior. Okay? They are well-posed, but not well-conditioned. 
So even if you have uh, systems or even a, sing a single ODE, you can get very nasty behavior. All right. But now we, ha we have to understand systems of ODEs because uh, partial differential equations, in some sense, you can you, uh, the most um, useful uh, way of seeing them for our purposes is to see them as an infinitely large system of ODEs. So let's how to, let's see how ODEs are done. Now, yeah. So so let's consider first of you. You know this constant coefficient linear ODE systems. Consider that first, like this one here, y prime. So we have some index i here, j because we have a whole system, and so there's some matrix A. This gives our, this is our this, the co constant coefficients. This defines a nice, simple ODE system, and then we know how to solve this exactly. Y is initial solution times e to the a t. Can be solved exactly. Okay, so very, that's very nice. Now, now we want to understand what's the long-term behavior of this solution. Um, and in order to do this, it's, it's uh, useful to transform A to what's called the Jordan form. We make a similarity transformation to write it as something which is diagonalizable, so in diagonal form, plus something which is nil potent, so n to the power of little n is zero. And then I can use this wonderful formula. So now for, for see why I've, I've written this as, I've pulled out an i, and there's also a k, which I could have absorbed into t. Anyway, and so now I, I can write my matrix exponential in this very nice way. And then I can write it as basically this, but because this is nil potent, the, the power series of the exponential stops at some point, and I get something really nice and simple. All right? But now comes the, the interpretation. So for example, if now if the, if the eigenvalues of d so let's say, let's say the n isn't actually there, so this, this time it's all diagonalizable, then the eigenvalues of d, if they are real, this is somehow, this is just oscillating and my sol solution is well behaved, it just oscillates, and obviously it's gonna be well posed because if my, uh, if the solution is oscillating, the norm is basically staying constant and nothing bad happens, all right? But if I have this other part, you can see that I have these, these things which they just grow in time and so this, in principle, can grow unboundedly. And if, if I have, if these ODEs, they correspond to partial, a partial differential equation, where basically for each grid point, I have an ODE, then this factor k can relate to the, the grid spacing, and if the grid spacing becomes finer, this growth becomes stronger, and then if I have such a factor, my system will may, may be ill-posed. All right, so this, it's, it's in order to do this analysis, it's very important to have this little picture and to split things into this Jordan normal form. And then, but we see that we can now completely understand the behavior of this in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix A. All right. Now, so now we have some principle understanding of how, the, how this works in the continuum problem. Now let's, uh, now, now let's discretize, let's solve things numerically. Uh, many many different uh, options, let's, let's keep it simple. So let's, let's look at a very simple ODE. And now we just replace the derivative by a finite difference expression, like the most simple one. Y prime is Y of T plus H minus Y of T divided by H. So this is the definition of the derivative. And then you can work out, you can, you can work out if you just uh, insert the Taylor series that Y prime is this discrete expression plus something which depends on the second derivative proportional to the grid spacing h, well, that's the grid spacing h, plus order of h squared. So what's the order of your error? Well, if you, if you use for derivative just this term, then this is the leading order error term, so it's a first order error. Okay, so we have, just by doing the little uh, Taylor series argument, we have computed what's the error term of my approximation. Now I can rearrange this, and I can say y n plus one is y n plus h times this thing here, where the f is given. I just I know how to compute this, and this is just my error term. This is what I use for my error estimate. I can. This is an explicit formula. I say I say explicitly y n plus one is y n plus this which I can comp compute. You can do different things. You can do what is called backward Euler, 
that is implicit. You can, you can say yn plus 1 is yn plus something which depends also on n plus 1. Then you have to solve this, maybe by Newton iteration. This ha maybe have some advantages, but in fact, but, but certainly it's more expensive to compute than this, because this is an explicit formula. Here I need many iterations. All right. Um, then I can, so I can, I can figure out now what, what my local error is. In particular, this is my, like we call this the truncation error. Just computing a certain term, certain terms in the Taylor series, I, I truncate you know, how many terms in the Taylor series I do. So for the Euler method, we've just seen this is first order. But of course, we, we must be able to do better. So we could use some higher order approximations of the Taylor series. And then we can ask whether this, whether this really works, whether the numerical approximation will actually converge. Because, of course, in the end, we're not interested in the, in the discrete solution. We are only interested in the continuum limit. What we can compute is the discrete, we can compute for some discretization, but that's not what we're really interested in. We're only interested in the limit. So we have to, at the end, we have to take the limit somehow. Uh, so now we can, um, in order to get the local tr truncation error, I, we can take the difference between the exact and the numerical solution that we get in one step. So this is numerical solution step n plus 1. And just, this is some sum expression, which is given by the time in the, 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 the previous time step and maybe all the, all the other time steps. And then the error is the difference between this and the actual solution. Call the method consistent. If the error divided by the grid spacing goes to 0, and convergent of order p if it satisfies this. And so with the Euler methods, they are consistent. So they're lot, they, they will, co in principle, converge. And they're of order 1. Okay. And then, of course, the local error is not the same as the global error. So you have to also compute the global error. Let me just skip this. Uh, then talk about the truncation error, which comes from just taking a finite number of terms in the Taylor series. There's another type of error which is the round-off error, uh, which I'm sure you're also familiar with. So the, 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 round, so the truncation error of a finite difference uh, scheme is not the only problem if you use a digital computer, because we are using numbers with a finite precision. Uh, and so um, how, much, how many bits we use to store these numbers on a digital computer, this is another source of possible errors. Uh, so usually, what one uses is double precision numbers, which, which is double precision is directly implemented in the machine hardware. So, so you have usually you have single precision, which in, in C is called float, or real real four in Fortran, and double precision, the double in C and double precision or real eight in in Fortran. Um, so this this is basically 16 digits, and this is half that precision. All right, this is implemented in the in the machine hardware. In principle, you can write software which allows you to take care of more more bits, which has more precision, but that usually makes it a lot, lot slower because you do this in software and these two are done in hardware. If you do, uh, if you do calculations in single precision, faster, but you have eight orders of magnitude and higher, higher round of error. So unless you really, really know what you're doing for some kind of iterative scheme where you have to iterate hundreds of thousands of times, that's usually not a, not a very good idea. Uh, another thing that you have to, um, understand is, is that, uh, so a, a number can, so on the computer, you can have a number, float or maybe double, but you can also have an undefined value, usually they're called nan, not a number, and these ones, uh, they are treated, so they're called exceptions because it's not a real number, so the number of operations that the computer has to do to treat a nan is a lot more than a normal number. So what, for example, if you have a code which develops a singularity somewhere in the grid, that will slow down your code tremendously because it produces NANs, and NANs are very, very slow uh, to treat. Um, all right, so this is what I want to say about round of error. Usually, usually you don't have to worry much about round of error, but you have to be aware that it's there. Um, then, another concept that's very important if you want to eventually use ODEs to solve PDEs is the concept of numerical stability and uh, stiffness. Um, so let's, uh, let's see how well the, the Euler method in principle is fine. Let's see how well this works. 
uh, for a real problem. So let's look at the, this uh, simple problem. Y prime is lambda y, linear. That's very nice. So we can write down what's the exact solution. All right, it has, it has an exponential, but uh, so we may be worried if lambda is positive, exponential growth, that may not work very well. Uh, let's just see. So let's construct our Euler formula, y n plus 1, our iterative formula, and then we can compute this ratio, y n plus 1 divided by y n, uh, and then we, so we get this, uh, the expression 1 plus h lambda. So now, if, if lambda is positive, then both the analytical and the numerical solutions, they will grow exponentially. That's not very good, but they will both show the qualitatively correct behavior. So that's fine. For some time, they will give you a reasonably accurate solution. But if lambda is smaller, so if you have damping, then the analytical solution is going to decrease exponentially, but it, the numerical solution only does this if you have this um, relation satisfied, so which, which is if your, your time step h is, is, is uh, small enough. So if your time step is larger, then the numerical solution ex exhibits exponential growth, completely different than the analytical solution, and so this is when your algorithm is unstable in the, in the sense that we had before. So you have the norm of the numerical solution grows and grows and grows and grows, and your algorithm is unstable. So we, have, we see that even in this very, very simple case, for something which is entirely harmless, the case when the solution is damped rather than growing exponentially, if a time step is too large, if you're too greedy, we want to do the solution very fast, we take a very large time step, it actually doesn't work at all. Um, if, if you have not such a simple problem, but one where you have very different decay rates, that's, that's more uh, serious, and so these kind of problems, you call them stiff, when you need very, very small time steps. And in, in, if you want to use ODEs to solve PDEs, you have a large system of coupled ODEs, and your stiffness is basically given by, by um, something which depends on the grid parameter. And so when, you, when your grid discretization is very small, then you have to do a very, very small time step. So this is highly related to, to what we've seen here. It is extremely simple uh, case. So now we've seen Euler in practice. Never use Euler. We use uh, things which are more accurate, higher order integration schemes. So a standard method is, is Ungekuta, which you can write this in a very general way, which we're not so interested in, just for your for consistency to be complete. And in practice, what is most useful for, for something simple, you may want to use Ungekuta 2, also known as the midpoint method, specifically the second order accurate version of Ungekuta, so one order more accurate than Euler, a very simple formula. Um, and here I've written down uh, both the Euler step and the Ungekuta step in Python. So if you want to solve an ODE with Python, you make one step of the solution. I just take this, this for Euler, this for Ungekuta, just iterate uh, as long as you want. And it turns out Ungekuta 2 is just second order, but it turns out that you can also, you cannot use this for um, PDE, we'll see later why. And then what you actually want to use is the classical Kuda or RK4, which is uh, now a little bit more complicated. And so this is the one that you want to use, for example, for solving the equation. The other ones are simply not going to work. They will not be stable. Um, and I think for the moment I don't want to say much more about this. Let's see what else we have. Uh, there's a slide you can look at for other integration schemes, and we have two minutes, and in two minutes we can talk about the most important topic of all phonetics, which is uh, convergence. Because as I said before, you're only interested really in the continuum solution, so you want to check whether you converge to a continu converge continuum solution and what the error is. So how are we going to do that? Uh, so you perform a convergence test. And so the basic idea Right, so you have some quantity x, whatever that may be, uh, in your numerical scheme, and you can compute this x for some grid resolution delta x. You choose delta x, you do your complicated numerics, and you get some answer. And for different grid resolution, you're going to get a different answer, x of delta x. Um, if your resolution is very good, then you may be 
able to approximate things in the following way. There's x0, which, is, which doesn't depend on delta x. It's the continuum true solution, plus a delta x to the n, some leading order term, proportional to some unknown a, plus higher order terms. And now you have unknowns x0, e, and n. So to determine them, you need three resolutions. And so what you usually do is you first, so you do your complicated numerics, maybe three months of calculations, to determine three answers uh, to the problem three x's. And now first you use them to, to, to check what's the value of n. Because if I, I use Runge Kutta 4, it's fourth order accurate. My, con my convergence order n should be 4. Okay? Now, because this is just a leading order thing, you will not find 4. Maybe you find 4.1. And you say, if I find 4.1, this is consistent with the expectations. Seems to be okay. I continue to compute e, but e is not that interesting, but in particular x0. And then I have an estimate for my true solution. And then I can compute the, uh, compute, estimate the error, for example, by the difference between x0 and the next highest resolution. If I find for my n, it's supposed to be 4, but it's actually 27, something's probably wrong. Either I don't have enough resolution, just this term is too large, or I screwed up the program, it's just wrong. Okay? So therefore, I check this first. Once this is consistent, I go to the rest. And I think I have to hurry up. The kettle is standing. So here, I don't have to explain this. So this is just a worked out example. If your delta x h h 2 h 4, h over 4, as you see all the explicit formulas. And that's, I think, all that I wanted to say. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks, Seth. Questions? Um, which is the importance of the extrinsic curvature in, in, in numerical relativity and in the numerical scheme for simulations? Well, it's, a, it's basically it's, if, if it's one of your variables. So, so in, in some sense, you set up the Einstein equations as some you know, partial differential equations, but some kind of dynamical systems where you can think of it as the, the, the three-dimensional metric, what we call H. This is your like position variable, your configuration space variable. And the k is like your velocity. And, and so then your evolution equations are equations for, basically one equation is velocity is x dot. And then the really interesting is, um, is the one for the acceleration. So the, the k dot equation, the long evolution equation, this is somehow your generalized acceleration equation. So it's just k is one of the two variables that you need. And you're setting up your dynamics. And there is no another maybe tensor scalar that uh, gives you the like the same the same velocity or or, or something similar maybe well, not using the extreme curvature so so now so now so now we so we've written down this this evolution equation written them down in terms of h and k i've also said that there are, there are problems for example your constraints may go off the constraints so there are all kinds of problems can appear so now uh, you you can try to fix some of these problems in redefining your variables okay making maybe the same number of variables, just defined in a different way, or usually a larger number of variables, which include, they introduce some extra degrees of freedom, but they have other nice mathematical properties. We're going to see this tomorrow. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense to choose different, different variables for each, to rewrite them, and then you may get better, better properties. So for example, like what we have for Maxwell, if you have a maximum and curved background, the constraint system is unstable. That if you choose square root of the determinant of the metric times your UNB, then it has better properties. So these are the kind of transformations you may be interested to do for your basic variables. In that ratio, it means that the code it works very well, but it means that the the solution is the correct solution, or no? So, um, not sure. Um, so if you 
what I want to say. Um, so when you when you ch you check whether your code is convergent, yeah. Okay. Right, so you have in general you have a prediction of what this number n should be, and then you check whether things are consistent. Now, now this checking it, this is very subtle. All right. So if you have just done three resolutions and you get you know you expect four, and you get let's say 3.9, probably it means everything is fine. Maybe you just got it by accident. We don't know, okay? It would be nice maybe to, to, to convince yourself to just do more simulations. Maybe you do not three resolutions, but four, five, six. That would be better. If this is, a, if this is an ODE or the wave equation, you will, be, you will easily be able to afford that. If each simulation costs you a million CPU hours, you may say, well, I don't need to know so precisely. And I, just, it, I, I cannot afford to do that calculations. Uh, and so, so in practice, usually, that the that the in for realistic simulations the the amount to which you can actually do a, uh, a rigorous convergence test is very limited because it's just too expensive and and as you may see in in the simple examples um, particular for the wave equation a correct interpretation of your even in a simple case correct interpreting your convergence test may not be easy. You, know, may, you have to do it. A certain amount of art may be required to arrive at the correct uh, interpretation. Oh, another question. Is it always convenient to choose the normal vector in the 3 plus 1 decomposition in the time direction? Uh, well, you can. You can um, if, you, if you want the standard... So for the standard Cauchy problem, yes, because it's a space-like surface. And so the normal is a time-like vector. If 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 you choose a characteristic things, the ge geometry is very different. Now, the, but the, the more interesting thing is that our our n, this is just we write the equations. We have this derivation using the time like time like unit normal. It, it appears as a geometric quantity, but but the actual coordinate freedom is defined by the the lapse alpha and the shift beta. So your 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 IDT tangent vector to your observers doesn't have to be in. It, it differs by the shift vector beta. Okay? And then, for example, if so the most uh, extreme case um, that, that you can have, if, if you have a, let's do it right here. Let's, let me make Schwarzschild. Now we have Schwarzschild. This has a horizon. Okay? How, how do you want to set up your gauge if you have a black hole? Well, what would seem to make sense is that your black hole has like a fixed size. All right? Well, what this suggests is your black hole horizon is an outgoing null surface. In, in standard Minkowski coordinates, for example, your outgoing null surface just eats up all the grid because it's an expanding null surface. So you want to choose coordinates so that this surface, okay, so in, your, in my new coordinates, this surface is the horizon, just go straight up. They, they remain in place. How can I do that? I can do this by shifting my grid points along the horizon and basically making the beta tangential to the horizon. But now my grid points, they, they move at the speed of light and inside the horizon faster than the speed of light. So, so then the, the actual the, the actual d by the t vector, the n is still time-like, but your actual motion of grid points becomes superluminal, which is a whole new range of problems. Uh, the 3 plus 1 decomposition can be done for all types or uh, universe, or there is a restriction of time? So I, I, I skipped that save some time, but the, what was somehow implicit in the slide about uh, in the global hyperbolicity, and maybe it was mentioned on the slide, maybe not, but it was at least implicit, is because you have, you have that my, this foliation of space-like hypersurfaces, and so the topology of my manifold M is basically R, or a part of R, an interval, cross sigma. 
So if you don't have this topology, it's not going to be globally hyperbolic. So, so that the, that, that's very important to understand. So for example, you want to do quantum gravity. If you want to solve, if you're interested in quantum physics, you may not be so interested in an initial value problem. And so if you, want, if you solve the four-dimensional Einstein equations, you can have all sorts of solutions and topologies, and you're not bounded to this. But if you want an initial value problem, stick with that. So it's a smaller solution space. Yeah, here. Uh, so you have very strong dependence on the on the coordinate system to solve the, mm -hmm. the problem. So I was wondering uh, in which way you can obtain the general features of, of the Einstein equation. Is there a way to say, well, Einstein equation behave like this or like this? Or you always have to pose the problem with a particular coordinate system? Well, if you if if you do your if you do your calculation you construct your space-time, you have to use some gauge fixing, okay? But of course, if you, once you analyze its properties, very often you are particularly interested in quantities which are gauge invariant, which are, which are easier to interpret, either gauge invariant in some four-dimensional sense or at least in a three-dimensional sense. Or, or not completely gauge invariant, but in some appropriate sense, very weakly dependent on your coordinates. Okay, and then of course to get intuition about the results, the kind, these kind of quantities are particularly important. Before we break for lunch, I have one announcement. There are four people sign up for giving a talk on Wednesday. You are still in time if you want to uh, to give a talk, but send me the abstract now. So check uh, check the program the four people. So each talk will be 25 minutes plus five minutes question. And we start on Wednesday afternoon after the coffee, the coffee break, right after the colloquium. Okay, we re reconvene at uh, half past two.